Wow, wonderful. I found that a really inspiring session. I don't know about you all. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of nods in the audience. If I could see you online, I bet you're nodding too. Um, our next session is going to take us beyond the limits of our familiar world here on Earth. That's right, we are going to talk about space. You might be surprised to realize that space actually has become an enabler for our everyday lives. It plays a role in how we communicate, work, and even how we travel. But space is also NATO's newest domain because the multiple security threats that could emerge there always exist. For example, there's the potential for the increased weaponization of spacecrafts, such as satellites. There's the need to understand humanitarian issues on a planetary level, such as massive migration and refugee movements. There's a need for more information about ad adver uh, our adversaries, with a recent example being North Korea failing to launch a spy satellite. In a moment, we'll watch a video about why space is important for our shared security. And then our moderator for the next panel discussion, Yuri Masson from Friends of Europe, will take the stage and introduce our next panelists. So let's roll the video. Have you heard this before? I need some space. Maybe you've said it to yourself. What if this wasn't about needing some space for a breather, but needing space itself? You know, space space. Technology used in space has an essential role in everyday life. Thanks to a satellite, live events are streamed thousands of kilometers away. Farmers forecast weather for crops. Apps deliver food to your door, geopositioning and real-time traffic updates. Financial systems, computer data and mobile phone networks, power grids. That's in addition to aviation, defense and communication systems. Space is everywhere and it's getting busier. NATO understands how important it is to protect our interconnected lives and economies which depend on space technology. Protecting space is no small feat. Some countries already have the means to jam, hack and even destroy satellites. NATO countries are responding by creating space commands and developing new technologies. And NATO itself has its own space center to support operations and missions, share information, and coordinate allied efforts. NATO has also named space as an operational domain, making it equally important as air, land, sea, and cyberspace. However, NATO has no plans to put weapons in space. Now add in the growth of what was once thought of as science fiction, commercial spaceflight. Space will become even busier as we begin a new era of space tourism. As more people on Earth look to the skies, NATO is addressing critical questions. How will we maintain our peace and safety even as space becomes busier and more competitive? How are allies working together to ensure responsible behavior in space? So what happens up there really matters, and that's why we are already at work to keep space peaceful and free for everybody. This is just the beginning of a vast ongoing conversation as everyone realizes we all need some space. Good morning, everyone, those uh, here at the NATO headquarters, but also to our lovely audience online. On behalf of NATO and Friends of Europe, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this panel discussion, Space, Technology and Security. And we already have a, have had quite a nice introduction, so I won't uh, take uh, your valuable time repeating what has been already said. Uh, so I'll just, let me just introduce myself. My name is Juraj Maitin, and I'm the Program Manager for Peace, Security and Defense at Friends of Europe. Uh, and together with our three esteemed panelists that I will introduce a bit later, uh, I will accompany you uh, throughout this conversation we, we have on a very important topic of space. And uh, as its name suggests, the aim of the panel is to discuss and raise awareness about uh, the new space age and the, the new space technologies, not only for our daily lives, because it's also important, but for our economic well-being and also for, uh, for international peace uh, and security. 
So to discuss this, this topic, uh, I'm joined by, uh, from, the, from the right side from, by Thomas Dermin, who is the Belgian State Secretary for Scientific Policy, Recovery Program and Strategic Investments, also responsible for space, space portfolio in the government of Belgium, and uh, Friends of Europe's 2020-2021 uh, European Young Leader. On uh, the left, from Thomas, we have Pauline Varnot, who is Senior Legal Advisor uh, at the International Committee of the Red Cross and lecturer at the Law Faculty of, uh, of the University of, of Namur. And last but not least, we have David Eagleson, a final year law student at the University of Cambridge, a policy fellow at the Pinsker Center specialized in space law and the militarization of space. But before we begin our discussion, let me just say that the, this is not only about our speakers sharing their views and their insights with you, it's also about you. It's, it's primarily about you, our audience. So uh, while they'll be talking, please think about your questions because I want to bring you to the debate quite, quite soon. So keep this in mind and I will seek your comments, your, your questions. I know that sometimes we, we say that make sure that your, uh, your question ends with a question mark, but you know, they're not this time. So please think about, uh, about it can be a comment or, or thoughts. Uh, and Thomas, let me, let me first start, start with you. But before we start, I would like to tell you a small anecdote. And when we were choosing the, the panel, the, 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 sorry, sorry the, the, the topic for the panel, we had a brainstorm in the office. And uh, my lovely colleague, Evan, who, who sits among you, told me that, you guys, we should do space. Because when, when people today hear space, despite the, really the, the, the high importance of it for, for, for humanity, they, they, they think about Star Wars or crazy rich people flying to space. So, so Thomas, uh, I think Evan's right. And uh, I, I know that uh, you, you face that dilemma yourself, because as a, even as a senior politician, in Belgium, you also face difficulties sometimes in, in persuading your, your colleagues in the government to, to put more resources to space. And if I may quote you, you, you said in one of your, 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 your speeches that I try to bring the topic of space to the political table, but at times are difficult on Earth. So Thomas, tell us why it's important to, to, to talk about space and why it should be of particular importance for, for young people. Okay. So good morning to everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. I, I was a bit surprised because it's the first time I'm called a senior politician. <laughs> um, anyway, um, on behalf of the Belgian government, uh, welcome in uh, Brussels in this impressive building of NATO. Um, I'm the youngest member of uh, the Belgian government. Uh, coming this morning at this event, I realized I would not have been allowed to apply to be uh, in the audience today. So that's maybe the reason why I was called a senior uh, politician. <laughs> um, I'm uh, indeed responsible for space in the uh, Belgian government. And I see a few smiling faces saying, oh, Belgium in space, what the hell are they doing, this small country? But actually, we're quite big in space. I mean, relatively small, um, but we are one of the highest uh, contributing member states of the European Space Agency, and we have amazing uh, companies building parts of rockets, building satellites. And why are we investing so heavily in space? Well, for many reasons. Uh, because mo most of the technologies actually we use today on Earth have been developed for space application in the first place. I mean, if you take your smartphone, uh, the fact that you have a touch screen was developed because in space you can only interact with a computer using a touch screen. So that was developed in the 80s for space applications. If you think of the internet, the internet protocol was also developed part of uh, space programs. And today, for example, we are working with the European space agencies on building colonies on the moon, so permanent settlement on the moon, and trying to design what will be a base on the moon. You need to think, oh, what do you do with waste? How do you consider circularity. And these kind of questions will be very important on the moon, but will be also very important on Earth when we think about the limits and the boundaries of our ecosystems. Um, another example is the climate, transition, climate uh, change and the transition we need to make. Um, basically, space is a very important ally in this transition. With space technologies, um, we uh, can better predict 
what will be the impact of climate change on Earth. Basically, with the European Space Agency, we built a digital twin of the Earth to be able to build on actual satellite data to model what is the impact of rising temperature on ecosystem, on migration flows, on uh, the sea level, etc. It's very important for governments to anticipate and to take the right decisions ahead of the rising temperatures. It also allows us to better react to um, dramatic events, such as floods, such as uh, droughts that we see at every corner of the world. Very important, and for all these reasons, we keep on uh, investing. Thank you, Thomas. Now, you, you, you presented a lot of opportunities that, that space offers us in tackling climate change in particular. But we, we know that when something's not regulated or poorly regulated, the, the capacity of the domain to deliver some positives to us, and it decreases. So we need proper regulation. And that's why we have David here today. So today we tell us, you know, is, is space well regulated? You know, I, I, know, I know that now we have a lot of new actors. <coughs> You know, that we, no, we have no more two competing superpowers as it was in the old days of Cold War. So, is space regulation up to date? Well, I, it's just as you say, things are changing so, so rapidly, um, even just in the last few years. Um, government is no longer the only player in space. Um, you know, we think about government spending a lot of money on, on their space programs, and they do. But just to take the, the one example of the United States, it's not as large as a percentage of, of spend on space as you might think. Um, the US spends only you know, less than half a percentage point of their overall um, annual budget on space. So it, it's smaller than you might think. And, and against that, you've got expanding um, private, uh, private spending on, on space programs. Um, so McKinsey did some interesting work um, in the last few years, and they found that Uh, private spending on, on space programs is actually rising around 22% a year, um, year on year. And, and so regulation is really struggling to, to keep up with that. The international framework that we're working with um, is really outdated. The overarching government, governing document is, is the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. And we haven't had a new um, UN space treaty since about 1979. So if you think about how much things are changing, how rapidly things have been changing since then, even just in the last few years, you can, you can see why we might be struggling to keep up. And we've got more states launching now than we did back in 1967. 1967, whenever um, the Outer Space Treaty was, was, was um, created, um, you know, we had, it was a big year for space, we had the most launches in the 20th century but we only had about four states launching. Today, more than 80 states have active space programs. So that's something that's worth, worth bearing in mind as we move forward. Um, with, those sort of, with more states being involved in space, we have, of course, increasing opportunities for collaboration, for, for doing positive things like raising people out of poverty, but it also comes with challenges. It, it's really difficult to get everyone to, to reach consensus at the UN Office of Outer Space to, to formulate new treaties, to formulate new policy. So what can we do? What can we do in the meantime to sort of try and unplug the gap and move ourselves towards a position where we might be able to adopt more binding frameworks once again? Um, states have sort of shifted to adopting um, statements of principle and, and other things in sort of soft law instruments. Um, we, we might think, for instance, of the, um, the Artemis Accords, um, recent US innovation. And What they're trying to create, according to the preamble, is, is, a, is a political commitment. It's not a legal commitment, but it's, it's getting a group of states, a group of like-minded um, states that think alike, that, that realize that the space environment is changing so rapidly and is in need of new regulation, to come together, to agree upon a set of, of common principles that can form the basis of binding, um, binding regulation. So that's a positive development, something that's happening in the interim to try and, and fill the void. Um, so not only have we got a challenge of increasing commercialization, of regulation struggling to, to fill the void, we've also got the challenge of, of space militarization. We're seeing space being militarized so, so quickly. NATO has, uh, NATO has recognized that outer space is now an operational domain. 
We see even in the war、um, in Ukraine, Russia targeting satellites with、um, anti-satellite weapons,、uh, cyber attacks predominantly.、Um, and if we look at the existing regulation, it's not apt to cover all of these situations. It's not. It's, it's very broad and overarching. It was supposed to be the, the broad governing document. States were supposed to reconvene and come up with more precise rules that, that could deal with these situations. And Article Four of the Outer Space Treaty, for instance, it deals very well with sort of prohibiting weapons of mass destruction placed in orbit, but it's limited to weapons of mass destruction and, of course, military installations on celestial bodies. It was never intended and never envisaged. All the sorts of space weapons that we might be seeing today, which can have just as, as equally a destructive effect on, on satellite systems that we rely on our,、uh, for our day-to-day lives. Thank you, David. Yeah, so we, we fear that the space will become sort of a wild west if we don't have enough of space regulation. Now, let's go to the audience. So I see. Hands being raised, so I think, lady in the first row, you were the first one. So can I? I think there's a microphone in the middle, right there. So please take the floor. And now I'll collect a few questions or thoughts, and then I'll ask、uh, Toma and、uh, David to react to them. But also, then I'll come to, come to Pauline, of course. So please go ahead. Thank you very much for your interventions. My name is Sofia Romanski. I'm a researcher at the Hague Center for Strategic Studies. And my question specifically concerns space debris and junk that is already in orbit at the moment. What kind, of, what kind of considerations are being taken into account in relation to space travel and exploration when we have already contaminated the direct orbit around our planet? And how does this threaten security for the future?、Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take one more, or two more.、Uh, a gentleman in the in the middle. I think. Janusz Kuska, European Youth Forum, Coordination Network for Youth, Peace, and Security, one of the co-chairs, and I want to ask you, because about the topic of resource exploitation in space. According to the to the space contract of the United Nations, exploiting resources, for example, on the moon, is not permitted for a single country.、Uh, what is your approach of exploiting resources on planets, astro- asteroids, and、uh, the moon? In this case, thank you. And now, a gentleman with a Ukrainian flag. I think so. <laughs> Will be the last one in the first round of your question. So please go ahead. Thank you very much.、Uh, my name is Antonio La Presilla. I'm a speechwriter at the Alde Party. My question pertains to China,、um, and, and you know, I'll try and keep it brief. I want to know, open to the panel,、uh, what do you think the threat、uh, of the Chinese Communist Party does it actually pose a threat to this idea that we can somehow, you know, have a, a framework of Of rules of, of international order, where we have countries and, and non-state actors to respect the laws, when, when we have a, a country like China trying to assert itself, both here on Earth and in space. Thank you. Thank you. So let's go. Let's put it to the panel then. So we have a、uh, quite a lot on, on plate, but please be brief because we want to make this interactive. So, Thomas, can you take the, the question of、uh, of, of、uh, the last question, the threat of China and、uh, and. And you can also link it to the、uh, need for closer cooperation of the Atlantic community. So, how how we sh- what we should do about the threat of China, and also the question on on, on debris, because actually the, we are living in space, a real paradigm shift, and actually all the three questions relate to this very basic phenomenon happening in space. The basic economical question in space is how much does it cost? To lift one kilo into space, and actually we have for this cost item、uh, something similar to a more low in、uh, in IT, which means that every year the cost of launching 
one kilogram into space, into orbit, is divided by two. And SpaceX and all the, 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 the trajectory of, of Elon Musk with the Starship to be, to be launched again in a few months is going to reduce it drastically further. Which means that basically, back in the days, up until five or ten years ago, only public players, mostly public players, could afford the cost of launching things into space. And so when you launched a satellite, it was really haute couture. So it was something designed for space, extremely robust, tested in extremely uh, adverse environment to make sure that the satellite you launch was actually able to work in space for 20 years. No, with the fact that basically the cost has be, had been divided by more than nearly 100 in a few years, what we see is new companies emerging and launching new items, satellites, by example, that have not been designed for space. But basically, if you look at a modern satellite today, it's much closer to a Tesla or to an electric car than a native space technology. Why? Because, of course, it's less robust, but you can launch 10 times more satellites, and you know that you, have, you will have redundancy because you, la you, you launch 10 times more satellites, and even if you have one or two that crashes, it's okay. This has very deep implications for debris that we need to anticipate. And what we need to do is, A, of course, space traffic management and make sure that we control the orbit. Two, circularity, how to impose norms on satellite producers to make sure that within the design of satellites, you embed rules to make them circular. And three, we need to um, develop new technologies, and that's what we do also with the European Space Agency, to be able to intercept and to develop the garbage truck of space. And that's, I mean, we have startups all over Europe working on this kind of project. On the question of China, um, It's a, it's a complex question. Um, we see that China, China is investing a, a lot in space. They're developing their own uh, space station. They are out of the uh, ISS for the next um, development. Um, but look, on, on many scientific projects, they're still on board. Um, so we need to be um, cautious. We need to make sure to keep on investing in space because we invest, especially in Europe, way um, less than the Chinese do. In Europe, on average, every citizen of, in Europe is investing 20 euro in space. For all the benefits that we get in space, it's ridiculous. In the US, it's, you say, 0.5% of GDP. It's about seven times the budget we put in Europe. Belgium is one of the highest contributing country to European Space Agency budget. It's 30 euro a year we put in space. Honestly, if you think of the benefits you get from space, from an industrial perspective, from a scientific perspective, from a security perspective on climate change, it's ridiculous. So the question you raise is very good. I mean, we need to have this kind of like, I would say, uh, balanced attitude toward China, but for sure we need to keep on investing. Otherwise, we will be completely out of the race. Thank you, Thomas. But I think you, you're doing a great job because, if I'm not mistaken, Belgium is the fifth largest contributor to the European Space Agency, right? So I think as a, as a governmental official responsible for space portfolio, you're doing well. And then there was a, a question about the exploitation of space uh, resources. And uh, can I ask David to, to wait in here? Yeah. So, um, of course, you, you've got these two concepts of principles flitting around. You've got the sort of province of mankind that space is the province of mankind. That, that's a principle that we find in the Outer Space Treaty. Um, but you've also got a, a, a broader approach that was predominantly put forward by the developing world. Um, for example, we look at the, the Moon Agreement, 1979, this idea that, that space is the, the common heritage of mankind. And there's academic debate about what the exact meaning of the two concepts is. There's quite a lot of overlap. But we might think about common, uh, the province of mankind as, as meaning that uh, space is open access for all, whereas common heritage has many more connotations of, of resource sharing, some sort of active effort on the part of, of space powers, those powers that have already got active space programs that already have the capability to exploit resources to, to share the benefit actively with the developing world. Um, and so you, you've got this tension um, between those states that can currently actively exploit space resources and are developing the means to do so, and those which 
perhaps newer space powers, that's way down the horizon for them. And so the question for policymakers is, how do we balance these competing interests and how can we pull states back together towards um, a common framework that we can all participate in? Thank you. Yeah, indeed. I mean, many, if, if you read a lot of space treaties and from the 1960s and 70s, you find a lot of wording, it's very inspirational uh, words like, you know, space as a common heritage of mankind or astronauts as envoys of mankind. So maybe we should return back to, to this mindset of cooperation. And, and we know that space is used not only for, for, for military purposes, but, um, which is because we're NATO, so of course yeah, this is the topic we, we talk about, but space and especially space in for data are, are important for, for humanitarian action. So to monitor floods, to, to monitor movement of cattle, and that's why we have Poland here. But first, before, before talking about uh, the humanitarian uses of space, and I think you're well placed because you represent the ICRC, which is the world's most prominent humanitarian organization. Can you touch briefly upon what the space regulation? We know that in, in humanitarian law, you have a strict distinction between military objectives and, and, and civilian objectives, and only military objectives can be attacked. And we know that in space, we see a lot of merge, merges, let's say, merging between the two, uh, the two domains. So can you touch upon that? And then you uh, comment on, uh, on the humanitarian uses of space or use of space for humanitarian action. Thank you very much, um, and thank you very much for inviting the ICRC here. And as you said, humanitarian organizations rely heavily uh, on a daily basis on the use of uh, space-based uh, assets. And so the ICRC is a humanitarian organization that has an exclusive humanitarian mandate to uh, protect life and dignity of persons in situations of armed conflict and other situations of violence, and to provide them with assistance. But our second, the second core mandate that we have is to promote and strengthen international humanitarian law, that is the body of law that is applicable in situation of armed conflict. And as you said, the question is, why does IHL matter in this kind of situation? Well, because of military activities, um, also in outer space, are constrained by inter existing international law, as David said, and that includes international humanitarian law uh, in situation of uh, armed conflict. And so therefore, in the very unfortunate uh, event where an armed conflict with all breaks, and take place also in space, IHL will provide very clear rule uh, to conduct hostilities, including the core IHL principles of distinction, meaning that uh, there is a distinction that, can, that must always be made between the combatant and uh, military objectives on one side that can be attacked, and then um, the civilian and civilian objects on the other side that cannot be attacked and must be protected. The second core principle is proportionality. That means that attacks that would uh, result in incidental damages, what we call usually collateral damages, but incidental damages that would be excessive to the concrete and direct military uh, advantage anticipated, are prohibited. And the last principle that is very important, especially when we speak about uh, debris, I will come back to that, is the obligation to take all feasible precautions to avoid incidental uh, harm. And there are more stringent rules also that will protect specific categories of persons, such as uh, the, and, and objects such as those that are indispensable uh, for the survival of, of the civilian population. But the three core principles that I spoke about uh, and that are applicable in the conductus hostilities can already trigger you know, reflections on very specific challenges uh, for the application of IHL that result from military operations in outer space or in relation to outer space. Thank you. And can you also briefly comment on the humanitarian uses of space? Yes. The, the other role of, of ICRC besides IHL. Yes, thank you. And it will also give me the occasion to come to two challenges that we also face as, as humanitarian. The first one is linked to the dual use natures of satellites. And I will come back to that. I know that you are very familiar with this. And, and the second one is the, indeed the risks that are created uh, by debris. So for the first challenges, uh, the, the dual use uh, natures, um, it's true that satellites are used by the military, but also by the civilians and also, of course, by the humanitarian actors. And uh, think, for instance, you know, as the weather services that we will use to try to, to pre prevent uh, the flows or at least to predict them, um, the shipping for essential goods, the, the satellite phone service that we will use in case of emergency. Well, the ICRC 
uh, in our operation, we rely on a daily basis on such uh, services. And so, for instance, 10 to 15 persons uh, of our field structure and personnel rely only on satellite communications. And we have 2,600 trucks that can only work if they are satellite tracked. So it means that in some contexts, we can only operate if we are provided with the necessary link with uh, other space. And so the disruption, of course, of those space assets can have a very detrimental effect for civilian lives, but also for the ability for humanitarian organizations to conduct their mission. And if those assets are indeed dual use, it means that in certain circumstances, they are used for military purposes, for civilian purposes, meaning that in situations of armed conflict, they can lose their protection and therefore be attacked, provided that they qualify as a military objective, but also the principle of proportionality, as spoke about, uh, is, is respected. And if I may just, you know, the, the very shortly, the second thing I wanted to it's speak very, about very is, is debris, yeah. because uh, there was a question on that. Um, Debris, they will continue, so if there are activities, military activities in outer space, the debris, they will continue to travel for decades uh, after, after the impact, and therefore they will also um, be capable to harm the, the satellite with possible also very serious consequences. And in the conduct of facilities, all reasonably foreseeable incidental harm to civilian and civilian objects must be, uh, must be accounted for in the application of the principle of proportionality. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for bringing this important humanitarian voice to this discussion. Let's go to the audience. So, a lady in, in, a, in a white over there. Thank you for your time. Um, my name is Margarita Al Castillo. Uh, my question is uh, regarding this recently established uh, Diana Defense Innovation Fund. How, in your opinion, uh, should the new NATO Defense Innovation Fund called Diana prioritize and foster uh, technological developments in order to address um, emerging security challenges such as the ones you have been mentioning today. Thank you. Thank you. So, question on Diana. And I, uh, well, I haven't taken questions from that side, so maybe gentlemen there in the, in the middle. Thank you for the floor and uh, for your um, insightful uh, conversation so far. Uh, I'm from the European Youth Parliament and I have a follow-up question uh, about the space debris because at our uh, recent international session in Kortrijk here in Belgium, a 300 young Europeans came together to discuss among others uh, space security and one of their suggestions was to um, invest uh, in the research uh, and technology uh, on managing and removing space debris as um, yeah, a really clean-up system for space. And I'm really curious what you, um, everyone here in the panel thinks of this uh, innovative idea. Thank you. Thank you. I see a lot of interest in, in space debris. Very brief, very last question. So, uh, yeah, gentlemen, they're in the back, and then we wrap it up with, uh, with our panelists. Thank you, David Bukowski, coming from the Hurdy School in Berlin. Um, I'm curious about the rising quality of commercial satellite imagery. We see that there's a lot of increase in quality. We see these um, synthetic aperture radar capabilities. Um, commercial satellites are starting to have intelligence value. Ukraine receives funding to purchase private um, satellite imagery. I'm wondering, how do you think we can approach regulating private actors that are starting to encroach on the intelligence gathering capability of states? and if this is uh, possibly a security threat going forward. Thank you. Thank you. So we have Diana, we have uh, space debris for the second time. Interesting topic in indeed, and an important one. And uh, risks of uh, rising quality of uh, intel uh, surveillance and intelligence. So who wants to, okay. to take the questions? You can take all of them, you know. No, I, I, I just comment on the, on the first one and the, and the last one on the debris, we, we mentioned it before. Um, we have an issue in Europe. Um, actually, most of the funds we challenge into space are challenged via European Space Agency, which has one um, part in the treaty which says that the European Space Agency can only work on civilian applications, excluding military applications. And that's the point that Pauline touched upon. 
Um, and the budgets for space are very small in Europe. I said it before, between 10 and 30 euro per capita per year. Very small for the, for the benefits we get from space. Um, and I will give you my examples of negotiation in the government. It may be of interest to you. I spent months on negotiating the increase of budgets uh, for the space budget, so the, spa the space budget we give to the European Space Agency. On average, it's 400 million a year that Belgium uh, gives to the European Space Agency. And then overnight come the 2% rule of NATO military spending, and you see your colleague and my good friend, Minister for Defense, who get a budget increase of 3 billion in a night. And actually, that's one of the big differences between Europe and China and the US, is that actually a lot of the space budget of China, of the US, is actually being channeled through military programs. And so the questions, me be trying to be smart, is to say, look, we're going to try to fund as many possible uh, dual-use programs, so programs that actually have military applications and civil applications. Because it's very easy, and it links to the third question, it's very easy to use a civil satellite for military applications. I mean, the data you, use, you get from a commercial satellite can be used for uh, military purpose quite uh, easily. And so we see, indeed, and in Belgium, we were pioneered to channel military funds into program of the European Space Agency. But it raises question on what's the statute of the European Space Agency and how can we, like NASA did it uh, a few decades ago, like the Chinese are doing, how do we evolve from a purely civilian organization to a dual-use uh, type of organization? And it raises question, the question yeah. Pauline raised on, okay, then we're going to have... Well, but maybe I ask you to briefly sum up, because we're almost at the end. And, so. And so, the, and to the last question, indeed, I mean, if you see the images that the Ukrainians are, are using are, are data from Starlink, and so it raises a question on, on, the, on, the, on the public sovereignty of these data, and so we need more and more to work and to establish collaboration protocol with those companies that are going to have better images than we can dream of, but we have to basically regulate the use of these types of data to avoid also commercial mechanism and the price of those data going up for uh, military purpose. Thank you, Gemma. So we have little time left. So any thoughts to wrap it up? Maybe uh, reflecting also on the questions raised. Yeah. So uh, Pauline and then David. OK, in one minute, less than one minute, then on Diana, it's a very good question. And so from a humanitarian perspective and IHL perspective, those considerations should be included from the outset, meaning that you do not develop any assets that would not respect uh, such a principles of IHN. And there is actually, because we spoke about Far West regarding law, no, yeah, yeah. there is no legal vacuum, exactly. and the yeah. IHL will apply, international law apply, including Article 36 that obliges states to take into account international law and to develop only weapons, missiles, or warfare that would respect international law. On space debris, uh, including uh, how do, do we remove them, the best way is not to create them. And the ICRC uh, has shared some thoughts in the Open and Network Group on the rejecting space threat through norms, rules, and principal responsible behavior to propose not to create such, such, uh, such uh, space debris by limiting activity that will create them, including by, for instance, uh, on the principle of precaution, using non-kinetics means to attack instead of kinetic means. And on the last one, do not always forget that humanitarian organizations also rely on uh, imagery, satellites imagery, so any, uh, any, um, um, yeah, any regulation on this respect should also include that and take that into account. Thank you. Uh, one last thought from David. Yeah. Um, we've run out of time. The one point I would make is it's worth bearing in mind, of course, that um, you might want to develop technology to deal with, with space debris. It's very important that we do, but it's worth bearing in mind the dual-use um, aspects of this mm -hmm. technology. For example, uh, we look at the likes of the Russian um, nesting doll anti-satellite weapon, um, which can sort of attack a satellite from above. It's the sort of technology you could use to deal with the space um, debris issue, but um, you can end up spiraling into a situation where you've got more anti-satellite weapons that develop out of that that can then make the debris issue much, much worse. Thank you, David. Thank you to our three panelists. We run out, run out of time. Thank you so much for your questions and for your reactions. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Yurai, and friends of Europe for that really interesting panel discussion on space security. I hope you all enjoyed that.